Hi folks, this is Moe's here. Hey, we're here to tell you about winter weeds. And did you know that winter weeds has actually changed world history? And also they've been used for food and medicines for thousands of years. Now I've gone ahead and picked out three of the awesome winter weeds that are out. As we drive around, we'll see them in, in fields and in forests. And I want to share with you today their amazing story. First off, we'll start off with this guy. Oh, you probably know what it is. It's the milkweed plant. And during the summer months, the leaves of this plant, as you're probably well aware, are the primary food for the monarch butterfly. The larvae come in and they actually feed on this. And this plant has chemicals in it that make that caterpillar taste awful. So the predators, the birds, and the other things that would feed on the monarch butterfly, they don't want any part of it, so they stay way away from it. The amazing thing is that that white juice that gives it its name, the sap, which comes out of when you pull the leaves off, that has been used by the native people for a glue, a primitive glue at best, but also they would take that and put it on warts to get rid of warts and it worked. But the amazing thing is this plant, this winter weed. Wait a minute, what's a winter weed? A weed is just a wildflower by any other name. After today, we're gonna call this the wildflower, the milkweed. No longer called a winter weed because the Moses teaching you about this plant the wildflower milkweed. This down that is in here is amazing. During the Second World War, the United States government was in a dilemma. They had to protect their soldiers and sailors that were at sea. We traveled across the oceans and some of those ships were sunk and sailors had to wear those life jackets to keep them alive. Well, the Japanese knew this, and they put a stop to all shipping and exporting of the flotation material used in life jackets, KPOC. The United States government said, what are we going to do? And they realized that this fluffy down from the milkweed was very buoyant. And they solicited school children in September to gather this. And they'd pay them a penny a pound. A penny a pound for that. Take a lot of that to end up having a pound. But it did two things. It gave the children money to be able to buy candy and things like that. Because a penny back in World War II went a long way. But it also gave them the spirit that they were helping our soldiers win the war. If it weren't for the children and their efforts during the Second World War, not only would a lot of sailors and soldiers have drowned, but also our president, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, may not have survived. What happened is during the Second World War, John Fitzgerald Kennedy was the captain of PT-109. It was a PT boat. And he was on patrol at night, and he was traveling in the ocean, just a few miles offshore, but in pretty rough water. All of a sudden, boom, his boat was struck by an enemy ship, and the PT boat sank almost immediately. Well, Kennedy was able to get his wounded sailors out of the boat, into their life jackets, and into the water. It was pitch dark. Kennedy looked around, he grabbed his men up, he was an extremely strong swimmer, and he gathered the men, and he actually pulled them all into shore, and they survived. And they survived because of Kennedy's bravery, and because of the efforts of the children packing and grabbing those milkweed seeds for the life jackets. I would like to share with you this plant, which we know as Old Man's Beard. During the growing season, it is a small little white flower. It's a beautiful plant. 
It grows as a vine, never more than about 10 feet off the ground. And as it grows, it has three leaves. Three leaves just like poison ivy. Some people mistake it for poison ivy, but guess what? It has some of the same characteristics of poison ivy. If you were to bruise what we will call when this is in bloom, virgin's bower, if you were to bruise those leaves and put them on your hands or put them on your mucous membranes like your eyes and your nose and around your mouth, it would create extreme irritation. So remember this, leaves of three, let it be. Poison ivy and virgin's power you want to stay clear of. Now as the plant matures, those flowers turn in and start to make the seeds. In that process, at that time, the plant is called the devil's darning needle. And they look like that through the early fall, but as the plant matures and goes into winter, the seeds and this fluffy stuff turns almost white and looks almost like snow. And that's the time when it becomes old man's beard. It's been used by Native Americans for literally thousands of years. They would go ahead and gather the roots, mix it with water, and they'd apply it to an awful disease that they had, and they got it mostly from the white man. Venereal diseases. When they had sores, venereal sores, they would put that solution on them, and the natives and the medicine men and women claimed that it healed VD sores. Now, as time goes on, they also learned that they can use that plant by taking the stems, putting them in water, letting it sit in there about two weeks, and then they'd go ahead and they would apply that solution to the face. And when they went to bed at night, they would have hallucinations. They'd have bad dreams. And most of them said that the dreams were about being an old man. And that's how it got the name, Old Man's Beard. The last, the third plant in this series that I want to talk to you about, you probably know. It's called Goldenrod. During a growing season in fall, when we get into August and September, this would be a brilliant yellow. Matter of fact, some people claim that it makes some of the best honey that there is. And according to WebMD, you could use this plant in order to go ahead and reduce pain. And also it was used, it could be used, for a diuretic. Now the Mose isn't a doctor, I'm just telling you what I read in the research, but a diuretic, what that does is it pulls water out of a person. Some people would say it's sort of like a water pill. The leaves, now they can be eaten when they're young and tender, and you can take the leaves and you can make a very nutritious tea out of them. Thomas Edison, the great inventor, he studied lots of plants. He studied the goldenrod, and guess what he discovered? He discovered that the goldenrod had rubber in it. He found one species, and we have over 100 species of goldenrod, but one species had almost 12% rubber. Well, he worked with Henry Ford to try to use that rubber to develop tires. Henry Ford was so impressed with Edison's work that he went ahead and gave Edison a Model T. And guess what kind of tires that Model T had? Goldenrod tires. As time progressed, of course we know we don't use uh, goldenrod for tires today. And the reason being is science realized that goldenrod rubber was a little too sticky and didn't have good tensile strength. 
Now, during the winter, when you see goldenrod, it looks pretty dead and dried up. But the one thing that you probably will see, that these galls are there. And what happens is, in the early spring when the plant is new, and the young tender stems are coming out of the ground, a little insect will go ahead and lay its eggs on the top of the plant. And the little eggs will hatch, and then as soon as they hatch, they start moving down the stem. They start moving down the stem until they get about mid-stem, and then they open up their mouths and they bite into the stem. And as soon as they do that, the plant goes crazy. All kinds of chemicals are coming in. The saliva from that larva triggers a response that the goldenrod needs to protect itself. So it sends all kinds of chemicals into the cells in this area, and it starts to build this case. It starts to build a home for the insect. And it completely encapsulates the insect. Well, there's lots of food inside that house for the new insect. And it also provides a covering, a fairly hard covering, from predators such as birds to be able to easily get it. Well, that insect will live in there and eat and just be happy as can be all through the summer, into the fall, and even through the winter. And sure enough, then when it comes ne the next spring, it will work its way out. It will have wings because it will be an adult. It will fly over to a new goldenrod plant. And it, after mating, it will deposit an egg. And this cycle will go all over again. Nature is fascinating how it's interconnected, how the intricacies of life work. And that's one reason we share these ideas, these plants, these animals on the Mo's Nose Nature. Now you will see in the wintertime these galls. And some of the galls are intact and the little larva is still in there. But others, such as this one right here, have a hole in it. Well, the insect hasn't come out, but a bird's gotten in. The downy woodpeckers just love to go in there and be able to put a hole in and pull that insect out for winter food. Now you might say to yourself, how in the heck can an insect survive in winter temperatures like what we've had? Last night in my house, right here where I'm at, where my studio's at, it was minus 22 degrees Fahrenheit. Yet those insects lived. You know why? They are able to create their own antifreeze. Not only can most insects create antifreeze, but even some frogs. And it helps them survive the winters so that life can continue again. If you like learning about these three awesome winter weeds that we now call wildflowers, make sure you give it a thumbs up. And subscribe to my channel because I'm going to have regular new information about nature. Thank you and have a great day.